Well, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Beatriz and Alberto. I'm very, very happy to be here. And um, what I'm going to do uh, this morning, <coughs> almost uh, noon, uh, I'm going to present um, a few ideas on uh, um, the testing of a few <laughs> theories, two theories actually, in order to try to explain what is happening nowadays in the Mexico City metropolitan area. I will be repeating a few concepts uh, already mentioned by Rafael, Laura, and Ignacio uh, regarding the uh, spatial concentration and the um, basically the temporality uh, that is immersed in trying to predict and trying to understand um, the dynamics of crime in uh, not only in Mexico, of course, but in many, many countries. So why this presentation in particular for today? It seems that uh, you probably you've read in the newspaper, we're having um, the beginning of a crime wave in the Me Mexico City metropolitan area, particularly in the conurbated area. We're experiencing um, decapitations, executions, uh, mass murders uh, in the conurbated area. And many of us are actually trying to understand this, but also fearing uh, the Ciudad Juarez phenomena, or the Tijuana phenomena, or the Acapulco phenomena, also in Mexico City, is basically these executions are related to uh, organized crime. Uh, uh, the mayor of Mexico City used to say that we had a kind of a boundary, a fortress. That fortress, I think, is in his mind only. <laughs> but uh, but we're having these problems, and we're seeing these kind of beginnings of uh, things getting worse. But it's also a matter of uh, trying to uh, think thoroughly about social crime prevention. Social crime prevention is the um, main idea of this sexenio, of this presidency. <coughs> Instead of only reinforcing the police institutions, the presidency via the National Security Commission, uh, the, which replaced the, uh, the Ministry of Public Security in, nowadays in Mexico, is trying to promote very strongly uh, social crime prevention. Finally, we will have some sort of a policy of social crime prevention at the federal level that is, of course, focused on 90 uh, uh, geographical areas. But we need to think thoroughly of what should we do exactly. In order to do this, I will be presenting the results of the testing of two macro theories. By macro theories, we mean aggregated behavior or criminal activity rather than criminal behavior at the individual level. And uh, the goal, obviously, is to think if an integrated approach, basically two or more theories, could help us to understand uh, the dynamics of crime. The method is a spatial analysis. This is very important because already some presenters have mentioned that uh, crime is uh, especially clustered. Uh, all human behavior, all behaviors, including human behavior, are geographically clustered. If we don't account for the clustering of the behaviors, the, these models, these spatial models, help us to control for that. If we don't do that, we can make mistakes of hypothesis testing. Maybe we, we have inflated null uh, hypotheses or uh, standard errors, and we may be overlooking some important causes if we don't model this data properly. For modeling this data properly, we have what we call a spatial analysis or a spatial methods. And what we, I will be presenting is the first step in the sense that this is the most general test of these two theories, meaning that I'm trying to explain all crimes, all crime rates, the sum of all the crimes in the metro area. I will not be speaking of homicide or robbery or theft or burglary in specific. So is the most general of test. I will explain very quickly what uh, these theories mean. The first theory is social disorganization. is a very old theory. It was formulated in the 1940s. Um, basically, you have processes operating over structures. What it says is the idea uh, that um, a low socioeconomic status, uh, residential mobility, namely migration into the neighborhood, family disruption, and routines and behaviors, and ethnic heterogeneity. This idea of ethnic heterogeneity is very American. Uh, for the Mexican case, we don't use, uh, we don't have race as a variable, or even though we know there is this discrimination, uh, et cetera, but we don't have a, a variable about ethnicity or race. But basically the idea is that these structures create or have some sort of pressures over society. Basically, you will have, as a result of these structures, you will have unsupervised teenage peer groups, low civic participation, sparse local friendship networks, which create a sense of or a view of social disorganization and collective inefficacy. 
The main idea here is that if communities do not protect each other, or the individuals within the community do not protect each other, the police cannot protect us all the time, everywhere. So there has to be some sort of a control or social control at the neighborhood level in order to prevent antisocial behaviors and therefore crime as a result of that. Um, the second theory is a more recent theory. It's actually based on Durkheim, Durkheim's idea of anomie. That is a very old concept. But this theory dates of the 1990s. It, it is also an American theory. It's called institutional anomie theory. And the way it works, basically, is that instead of speaking of structures, it talks about institutions which also create processes, like the idea that monetary success is the only thing that is important, and uh, there are pressure, there are, in this case, anomic pressures over the individual that force individuals or facilitate individuals to get into uh, illegal activities and crimes. Basically, a weak polity, no economic opportunities, social inequality, and also the element of family disruption, which is a concept that connects both th theories. In a society that is, lead, uh, that is led by uh, monetary success and lower um, controls of institutions, such as the economy again, the family, the church, schools, etc., creates anomic pressures. And if uh, the idea is that the monetary success is an end and there are not enough um, legal means in order to get this, this end of monetary success, there are, as I said, these anomic pressures and that creates crime. So what happens when we put these theories together, when we test them one against the other? The way I did this uh, was by reviewing all, most of the literature in social disorganization and most of the literature in institutional anomie in terms of empirical evidence. Using a regression analysis, you find a very large body of literature in, this, in these two theories. And I um, selected the variables that are more currently used or the correlates that, most, that are mostly used uh, for testing these theories. For social disorganization theory, I got the social inequality index, migration, female household, headed households, and bars and restaurants. This is a correlate, by the way, uh, that is also related to uh, in routine activity theory, that in the sense that there is also a, geogra there is a geography of crime opportunity, <laughs> but it also creates um, apparently disorganization. And for institutional <coughs> anime theory, I used uh, the multi-used idea of voter uh, the variable of vo voter turnout, the Gini <laughs> index, great retention, and female-headed households. So you have uh, one same variable uh, that connects both theories. Um, so the case study is Mexico City metropolitan area. <coughs> you know it's a very, 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 very big city. It's 20 million inhabitants in the 2010 census. This is the map of the population. Uh, per municipality, uh, this is the definition of the National Council of Population of the Metropolitan Area. Basically, the 16 delegaciones of the federal district, 59 municipalities of Mexico State, and one municipality in the state of Hidalgo that accounts for 76 municipalities. It is a very dense uh, area. Uh, the growth has uh, decreased, uh, but it's still increasing at 10% rate uh, in the last decade, and this circle that you see right there is, uh, is a called a standard distance, and what it tells us is that approximately 68% of the population live within that radius. And uh, we're gonna see that there is a match between this, a spatial match between this standard distance of population and the standard distance of criminal behavior. And the point that you see in there is the weighted mean center, namely the position where would you would be closer to all the population in the city. Uh, and this is the geography of crime. This is the rates for all crimes. Uh, we have the uh, weighted mean center of crime. It's that little point, the yellow point. It, as I said before, it tells you uh, is the closest location to all crimes. Of course, this, in this case, what we're using in this calculation is the center of each municipality. So that point is the closest of the, the optimum distance to the uh, geographical center weighted by the crime rates. And what you see basically is, um, is uh, concentration, uh, the, radio, the radius, so the standard distance is a little bit larger, but there is a concentration in the central area of the Mexico, Mexico City metropolitan area that is mostly the federal district side. Uh, and a little bit, a few municipalities of uh, the conurbated area. This, um, the, re the most red color 
uh, at the center that is basically the center of the city, but it's not the geographical center, or the, the center of the metropolitan area, but it's not the geographical center uh, in essence. So we do have a special dependence. Crime rates are actually clustered and are heavily dependent. What happens in one municipality partially depends on what happens in a neighboring municipality, and we have to account for this. To be more precise, uh, we, um, well, I conducted a hotspot analysis, and basically the, the, what we're looking here is which municipalities are significantly different uh, under a normal below a normal curve, which municipalities are uh, similar and dissimilar from its neighbors. And what we have is this red, big red cluster. Uh, we have 10 hotspots, and this big red cluster is basically this, the municipalities that uh, have high levels of crime rates and are neighbors of other high crime, um, uh, high crime uh, municipalities as well. We have one low level um, hotspot. What it means is that there is a lot of crime in there, but, but very little crime around it. Um, and uh, maybe some, in some cases we find hotspots that are, have very low levels of crime rates, and which are surrounded by very high levels of crime rates in other municipalities. That's the case of a few neighborhoods in Ciudad Juarez. We call them uh, kind of a peace heavens, and these are important too in contextual analysis in order to know well what happens exactly in those places that is apparently working out uh, against crime. These cri are these communities helping each other, trying to protect themselves, or do they have home security systems? What is happening there? Well, we don't have that in Mexico City in metropolitan area, unfortunately. What we have is basically hotspots, and these are the areas where most of the crime is um, is uh, concentrated. And this is important for it because of the policy implications. The policy implications means that if you want to have significant changes in uh, reducing the crime rates, what you, you what, what you can have is by focusing your resources, police resources and social crime resources in a specific areas, you may have bigger effects, you may have better results. So it's important not to think in terms of averages and means for the complete area, as, as we, some presenters were mentioning here, but to focus on those areas that have the most important uh, elements to reduce crime and find or get significant decreases. So um, place matters. Place matters a lot. I know that uh, there is a, there was a big uh, debate in the 1990s between political scientists and geographers. Political scientists saying that uh, you know place does not matter as long as you have all the variables that explains the characteristics of places. And in geography, we still believe that place matters uh, because of the culture and the ways people behave in some places, independently of the socioeconomic composition of places. Some places may be similar in terms of their demographics and socioeconomic characteristics, but still they behave differently because there are other types of institutions or behaviors <laughs> between us. So if uh, place matters, we cannot affect, or we cannot, excuse me, we cannot expect same policy effects in all places. We will have significant increases or uh, advances in some areas and maybe no effects in other areas. The typical mistake of our local politicians is to think that similar policy actions can be utilized elsewhere, everywhere, anytime, and that is not true. In some places, again, some policies work out and others do not work out. And so here, what we have to do is to look at the maps really well, what the maps are really telling. And it's not only the magnitude of things, it's not only the map that we just saw where you see these very reddish colors and pink colors, so we should put all the resources in the reddish colors or distribute it uniformly. It's not only a matter of magnitude, but it's a matter of relationships that we want to alter. So in those maps, we can make some, some matches. We can put one map on, among the, uh, above the other. And then we, we understand that these behaviors are not univariate, but bivariate or multivariate, and what this map tells you is about the relationships that we need to alter. So, the evidence. Are these theories compatible or incompatible, and how exactly <coughs> does place matter? Uh, very quickly, I will say that uh, I um, run a regression for social disorganization, another one for institutional anomaly theory, and the final column is the test of the both theories at the same time. Uh, they seem to be very strong, independently separated, but when you put them together, institutional anomie vanishes. 
social disorganization becomes the theory that uh, removes a statistical significance for institutional anomie. And, um, and what it's what says the, re the residuals of the Moran's eye basically saying that these variable this is good news because these variables are not um, are living without significance as well as the residuals of the models at the geographical level. What it means is that it's able to predict at all municipalities or the model works well for all municipalities for the entire uh, area, but there are some particularities which I'm going to show you in just a minute. So this are these theories compatible? Not really. Only in the female household variable, which is, by the way, the strongest correlate to predict cr crime rates at, in this area of Mexico City. They do agree on that. They do not disagree in that respect. Each theory is able to predict crime rates. But when they get together, um, social disorganization seems more capable. Or the correlates that depict social di <coughs> disorganization uh, seems more capable. The relationships, though, are okay, as expected in theory. So uh, our uh, American friends uh, were able to come up with a good theory for the Mexico City metropolitan area. Yes, there is a strong relation between female ha households that what implies is less supervision of minors, and that creates more crime. And bars and restaurants, which is basically a routine activity theory as well of um, correlate. What it tells you is that there is a geography, geography, as I said before, a crime of opportunity. You have more targets, and if you have uh, individuals that are motivated to create or to commit a crime, you will find them in those central areas. Now, very important, is still, even though at the general level, only looking at the table, these variables seem, ca or these theories seem capable to predict crime rates. When you try to predict them at the individual level, they don't work as well, or they what they present is a, a a concept called a spatial <coughs> heterogeneity of effects. Namely, that the effect or the strength of the relationships that we're predicting here are not as um, strong all over the area. And then we have, what we mean by this is that we have to look at the spatial fits of the theory, not only the fit of the complete model of the theory. And what <coughs> we have here is the map of the uh, R squares of the coefficient of determination for each municipality. And what we have is that uh, this uh, bluish or more uh, intense blue color, darker blue color, uh, what it tells you is that it gives you a better fit in that, th in that region of the, of the city, whereas in the uh, more pale blue color, what you have is a weaker relationship. Again, this is evidence that not all theories can predict with the same strength everywhere. And what it means in terms of policy implications is that we have to be very careful in where we, where are we, what are we going to do where and how much many resources we're going to apply where. Um, and this is even more interesting. We not only have uh, different magnitudes of the relationships of the theory, but also we have negative effects in some places and positive effects in other places. What I'm showing here is the map of the relationship or the prediction of the f if we increase female household households, then increases crime. But in some municipalities within the metropolitan area, the relationship is inverse. In those cases, very few, fortunately, if we increase the number of female-headed households, then crime uh, reduces. That is an, an abnormality. Someone would say, well, maybe the model is incomplete. Maybe you, sh you should have added another variable. But in order to be very loyal to these uh, formulations of the theory, uh, I didn't do it. That would be the second step. The first step was this one, just to test the theory based on the most uh, typical classic uh, correlates that are used in these tests. Well, they don't give Nobel prizes in criminology. So what I've presented and we were, what we have been talking actually is a lot of common sense. Um, we know quite well every time we go to conferences, we've been to many conferences, we think we, I think we're, we have a clear idea of what we have to do. The problem is implementing this on the territory. This, what, should we do in order to things to work out? So for the Mexico City metropolitan area, uh, violence is very much a process of female-headed households. Careful with this because what we have is an increasing divorciality rate 
uh, all over the world. So uh, some uh, demographers and sociologists of family are talking about the new family structure or the new family unit. And um, so this is a trend and that we are not going to be able to stop. It is happening all over the, the world. But if that increases the risk factors of the youth to get into crimes, then we should be having more emphasis on the new family, basically to increase programs uh, for family units and the youth. I'm using those quotes not because of vanity, but because, uh, not at all, but because uh, these are, this is empirical evidence for the, metro, uh, for the metro area of Mexico City, where we have found that more scholarships decreases the number of drug crimes and vandalism among, among high school students. We have to give more scholarships and keep students in school. And we have also observed, based on our prison inmate surveys, that more alcohol abuse leads to intrafamily violence, and that leads to more crimes and more prison inmates, larger penitentiary population, which eventually, as you know, the prisons harden individuals. They, uh, prisons make people more vile, and you may have more, uh, I'm on time, when you may have more um, serious crimes in the future. So it's like a snowball, the penitentiary problems. So what to do? We have to make a combination of social and situational crime prevention. Actually, uh, situational crime prevention, home security systems actually work. Uh, they are more um, efficient, no, more, uh, they have more efficacy to reduce victimization rates but um, they do not reduce fear of crime. So that's another area of policy that we should be working out. But what is the Mexican government doing nowadays? So we just, I just said, and I will be finishing with this, crime in the metropolitan, Mexico City metropolitan area is not about migration or doesn't seem to be about that. It's not about great retention or the keeping students in, in, in the schools. At, in a, as a general trend, and it's not about voter turnout uh, either. It's not a democratic problem. It's not a democratic problem in the sense of making people go to vote. But we are investing almost $1 billion this year from the National Institute of Elections. It used to be the Federal Electoral Institute. Now it's the National Institute of Elections. And what we're directing to uh, social crime prevention is only $190 million. Nevertheless, the damages the costs and losses from crime uh, in 2012 accounted for 25.4 billion US dollars. So it seems that we are putting a lot of money in some places and not in others. Nevertheless, the main problem nowadays in the public opinion and in the voice of many um, in, uh, presenters uh, today was crime. Thank you very much.